Okay, well, welcome everybody. I see people joining into the uh, webinar. So in these first minutes, we will, of course, let people find the door to the webinar, make sure they've come to the right place, settle into their chairs, get their cup of tea or beer or whatever it is um, you want to be drinking while you listen to us. To make conversation while we're waiting for, for everybody to join in. Um, I can wish everybody a happy 8th of May, at least here in, in, in France, where I currently am. The 8th of May is a day to think about peace in Europe. Um, so that's a positive, positive uh, message. Also happens to be my son's birthday. So there are two things, two important things I think about on this, on this day. So I hope that uh, everybody's having a, a good day as I've, as I've been having, and I hope my son's been having as well. Um, I'm gonna give it another, another minute and then we will kick off, uh, kick off this exciting panel about a really important issue. Um, you know that because you're joining, you're joining the seminar, delivery workers in the platform economy. I see the, the, the happy birthday messages are coming through the chat. Thanks, thanks very much, David. I'll pass that on. Okay, well, I think we're going to, to kick off. So welcome to this um, discussion this evening about delivery workers in a platform economy. Uh, my name's Nicolo Milanese. I'm Director of European Alternatives and also a steering committee member of Another Europe is possible and the two organizations another Europe and, and European alternatives putting on this uh, this talk together about this crucial issue of the rights and working conditions of delivery workers in the platform economy um, opening up a kind of European panorama um, about this issue it's part of this conversation is part of a uh, larger project that we call Workers Without Borders um, that is looking at uh, the situation of workers in particular in crucial sectors of the economy. And we're starting with three platform workers, which we're discussing uh, today. The care workers in the care economy, which will be a discussion we have in a couple of weeks on the 26th of May, and agricultural workers, uh, which we'll be discussing on the 14th of May. June, um, looking at these three sectors in which there's a certain degree of innovation, um, there's also tends to be a significant number of migrant workers. Um, and migrant workers, in our experience as organizations, um, are often at the front lines of changes that are happening to the whole economy. Um, so it's no accident that it's often migrant workers who are um, fighting and mobilizing first because uh, they are the, uh, the ones who are first affected by the way the economy is changing. So we're wanting to look at um, the situation across Europe um, in those three sectors. And that's a timely thing to do as well, we think, because um, perhaps obviously the COVID pandemic over the past year has put a bit of a spotlight on um, the conditions in those uh, sectors. Um, and so there's perhaps a little bit more of a chance to make policy changes. Also, it happens that European policymakers 
are paying a little bit more attention, both for the reasons of the pandemic, but also even before the pandemic, there was um, an awareness that there were serious problems, I think, in the, in the platform economy in particular, uh, but also uh, in, in care and agricultural work and in other, other sectors. And so it, it, um, the European Union, for example, uh, has already started to take some measures already prior to the crisis and uh, just these last days, in fact, yesterday and today, there's a social summit in Porto of the European Union in which the social pillar is being discussed. And one of the um, ambitions of that social pillar is to get rid of precarity in the European um, workforce. Then we can discuss, perhaps we will discuss a little, whether any of the measures that are proposed are sufficient to do that. There's still, I think, a lot of questions about how to uh, get rid of precarity. And so we're going to try through this debate also to come up with some proposals um, to, to put to uh, the European Union, but also uh, neighbouring countries. The UK um, is, is an important one. Um, so that's a little bit the context of this discussion. I want to say that then after this sort of first cycle in, in these coming weeks, looking at the European situation, we also want to link it up to uh, the global situation, because these changes in the economy are happening everywhere, and uh, workers are mobilizing everywhere to, um, to try and improve their rights. There's many examples I could uh, mention, but of course, uh, uh, particularly uh, problematic environment to doing that is in China. And if we think about Chen Zhaojin, um, who was just a couple of months ago arrested uh, in China for trying to organize um, delivery workers in the platform economy, uh, we see that you know, the conditions can really be quite fierce in some places. And so we want to open up also to a more global perspective in a second stage of this, of this project. Um, but bringing it back uh, to today, there's one further reason why it's, why it's topical, um, and it's the right moment for this discussion, it's that the uh, European Union is engaging in a process called the Conference on the Future of Europe, starting from tomorrow, and another what thing we want to achieve um, with this cycle of, of events is to make proposals uh, to feed into that process and make sure that workers' rights are heard through that uh, channel as well. Um, in today's discussion, we've got three really fantastic speakers. Uh, I'll briefly introduce them and say how this is going to work, and then uh, I will let them take the floor. So, Joanna Borowicka is going to speak first. She's a she's a sociologist who has been uh, thinking and studying a great deal about these uh, changes in the platform economy. Economy. So she's going to give a kind of overview of of the situation and pose some crucial questions. Um, Ori Mittenmeyer. Um, is someone who has personal experience of being a um, delivery worker and then fighting to improve the rights of um, people in the platform economy. And so he is going to share uh, some of his experiences. Um, and Henry Lopez, the General Secretary of the Independent Workers of Great Britain, uh, will talk about union organizing and some of the recent wins that, um, uh, that they have recently achieved in, in the United Kingdom. Um, throughout the discussion, you're very welcome to pose questions in the chat. Uh, we'll try and make it as interactive as we can as we go through, but I'll also make sure that there's plenty of time um, in the last half an hour or so for us to have a discussion. One last note is that um, Ori is uh, rather hard of hearing. Um, and so uh, if he um, turns his mics on and asks people to repeat, um, don't, be, don't be offended. It's because uh, he needs you to repeat or say things clearly. Um, and, and to help him out, um, we've, we've, we've put on something called live transcript, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. Um, it may be that others of you need, need it's useful to follow the transcript of, of what people are saying uh, as this goes, goes on. So uh, without further ado, I want to turn to you, uh, Joanna, to, to perhaps give an overview of you know, as wide as you can as a European perspective of the way you think digitalization in particular has affected the economy and some of the problems that's caused when it comes to workers' rights. Joanna, please. 
Well, good evening, everyone, and um, welcome from Berlin. This is where I'm currently based, uh, where I've lived for the last seven years, and where I'm conducting my, my research. Um, I want to open with an image, an image of um, a guy driving a minivan, not a truck, just a small vin minivan. Um, he's delivering parcels, he's delivering um, what we buy on Amazon, maybe for Amazon, maybe for DHL. Actually, he just takes gigs from whoever pays more at the moment. He doesn't actually work for any of these companies. Um, yet, uh, he spends 14 hours a day driving. He doesn't actually take breaks. He doesn't take breaks to, to eat, to, uh, to use the toilet. Um, he's just trying to get as many deliveries done as possible because he's paid by the delivery and um, not by the hour. So I think that uh, if we think about him and, you know, it is very likely that he is from Poland. He's looking forward to being able to go back to see his family, his, his wife, his kids. Um, I think he, like, it, 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 the important thing about this image is that um, he's working for this chain of platform economy. And we often think about Deliveroo, Uber, Fedora, all these companies that deliver food, but he is the visible part of the chain, the invisible part of the chain. And um, what he has in common with the Deliveroo and Fedora and all these companies is the fact that he's self-employed. And what I want to talk to about today is that uh, what is really hidden uh, behind the term platform economy is not this high tech um, or even innovative business model, um, because there's nothing innovative about um, explo exploitation and the, the platform economy really rests on a phenomenon that is quite old and this phenomenon is self-employment. This truck driver that I'm describing, he is not an employee of the company, um, which means that he doesn't have minimum wage, he doesn't have vacation, he doesn't have sick days and he has incentives to work as much as possible because he's paid per gig. So two very old phenomenon that I will talk about today is uh, actually self-employment and migration because these are, uh, in, in other words, it is not technology, but these gaps and protections that we know, we've known for a long time, gaps of protections of migrants and self-employed that make platform economy possible. But technology, of course, has played an important role uh, because it adds a layer of digital to what have already been uh, very precarious working conditions. And I will also talk about that and um, how that works. Um, so finally, I will show how we all pay the price of this gap in law, which leaves the self-employed um, outside the system. And finish by asking a very, very urgent question is what should be done? to protect these self-employed mobile workers. But first, I really want to take a look at the social and legal context in which platforms were able to sprung up, spring up. And these are the three interrelated phenomena that I already mentioned. Two of them, it's important to remember that two of them predate any discussions about uh, technology and gig economy. And only one is quite new and related to digital capitalism. The first of these phenomena is self-employment. I already mentioned that self-employment is um, key here and that it's not new because this discussion about destandardization of work or flexibilization of the job market is a very broad process and uh, one that we have witnessed for a um, couple decades. Um, a key to remember here though uh, is that self-employment can be forced or voluntary. So, um, forced is, of course, where you don't really have a choice because uh, your economic conditions uh, mean that either you sign the zero hour contract or the VEC tag, or there's no job for you. Uh, but oftentimes when we hear piece of people that participate in this discussion about self-employment is people that actually chose self-employment and going solo um, was quite liberating for them. 
And another thing that is important is that in many countries, uh, it is quite clear that self-employment can be fake uh, or bogus. There are many terms for this if there's uh, only one employer. But the result is the same. There are no protections, whether it's uh, forced or, or voluntary, whether it's fake or whether there are, so there's one employer or multiple ones. The result is the same. There are no protections. There are no, there's no minimum wage, no vacation, sick days, or what is important, no right to unionize or to strike. Now, another thing is that self-employment plays out differently in different countries. In general, um, when we think about migration and we look at the data of, uh, but OECD data about the percent of employment of em total employment that is covered by self-employment, it is higher in countries where migrants come from than in countries where they go to. So for example, uh, if we took, take uh, example of migration to Germany, Poland has 20% of self-employed. Turkey has 31%. Germany is only 9%. So I think UK is a little bit of an exception here because it also witnessed uh, a huge destandardization and flexibilization of the job market, but it's still at 15%. So it's significantly lower. So when I've done a lot of research with uh, different types of mig migrants, including refugees, undocumented migrants, and economic migrants from the EU and beyond. And, um, and I think that when we look at this, uh, the fact that they come from countries uh, from where self-employment is high, uh, there's often a narrative that they come Kind of sort of with like a broken, from the perspective of the receiving countries, which have the strong labor system, that they come from countries where there is a bit of a broken um, labor system and that they, that they bring these values that they don't care about the unions. But I think there's also a different way to look at it. And this is something that I often uh, hear from talking to people is that migrants are often the best educated people in their communities or the most entrepreneurial man mindset and migration in general is kind of an enter enterprise. This is something that requires a lot of, you know, self-drive and mobility and being able to adapt to new, con new conditions. So this, this deep, the people that, that migrate are often the people that are most excited about uh, being on their own and not having a, bo having a boss. Um, and they really buy into this entrepreneurship narrative and entrepreneurship is the new man mantra of our times. And we know where it comes from. It's, it's the California ideology and the Silicon Valley. And although of course it, one could argue it rests on an older trend. Um, it is really what uh, one sociologist, Oliver Nachtwey calls the digital spirit of capitalism that has uh, that has really uh, plugged into these uh, pre-existing um, pre-existing phenomena that I've discussed. And the, the digital spirit of capitalism, just to tell you briefly, is this idea that uh, social problems can be redefined as technological problems and that they can be solved with technology and with proper, for example, AI or algorithms. So uh part of this uh solutionism contains a certain disenchantments with politics and institutions and that also includes the unions so what i'm trying to say here is that it is of course the platforms that 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 we know uh rests on technology but what is really new here is uh, is the idea that if what is missing in your life is the lack of autonomy, technology will give you that. And that technology is what will set you free from the constraints of time, from the constraints of place, because you can work anytime from any place that you want. And it will be possible for you to work solo, so without any colleagues. And what is most important, you will not have a boss. And this is something that a lot of, uh, a lot of, especially migrants want to say, I don't want to move to another country and have 
you know, a, a boss, especially from, from a different country than, than my own. So the, what I've tried to show you so far is that it's not this high-tech innovation that really helped platforms to click and fit right in, especially in the urban modern centers. It was really, and this is what, what came out in our research, how catchy this slogan was. The slogan to be your own bo boss. And thousands of people um, that sign up for Deliveroo, Fedora, and Uber Eats, and all these companies really believed this promise. And this was the starting point of our research with Deliveroo and Fedora here in Berlin. Two companies uh, for, for food delivery, a uh, slightly different business model because Deliveroo was working uniquely with self employed people, whereas Fedora. Um, hired for these short-term um, contracts, but still they were employees. Uh, but they, what they really, uh, what we really wanted to see uh, was the fact that they didn't have a boss and they only um, got their orders through the app. So this is where technology really comes in. The app as a boss. And the promise of that was exhilarating for a lot of young people from many, many different countries. Um, it was very interesting to see this very multicultural, multilingual environment of you know, young, excited, very uh, vibrant people that were really excited about riding the bike. They really thought that this was a great job. And um, what happened is that they believed that this job would give them the flexibility to combine it with other passions or maybe with studying. So the autonomy, the flexibility that I've been talking about was really the key promise. Um, well, unfortunately, and this is what the topic of our research was, uh, there is this the fact that there is not a boss doesn't mean that there is no management. In fact, there is a new type of management that we call um, the algorithmic management, and uh, it is very controlling. And it means that uh, the, the app becomes where the control is embodied. And the way it works is that every time that you make a delivery, you have to you know swipe for each step of the delivery and then incredible amounts of data are collected about your work. And that data is not only used to optimize the algorithms for the, for the companies, uh, but it's used to control the workers. And this works um, because there's often in these companies a system where performance is uh, evaluated and only the people who have the best uh, performance are given access to the best shifts. So in other words, if you haven't been you know, working really, really hard and uh, your statistics are not so great, you will not have access to the shifts that work for you. You might not be able to drive or ride in the time that's good for you. So this flexibility that was the promise um, is gone. And on top of that, um, and this is the, the kind of digital layer to precarity that, 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 that we discovered is that, you know, in every job place, there are certain rules. And part of the job is for somebody to explain you the rules and for you to learn the rules. This is not how it works in a lot of these companies. Um, how it works is that you have to kind of work with the app and figure out the rules and the algorithms as you go. And uh, there is no company, there is no person that you can call and ask if you have a problem, if you're trying to figure out what consequences of certain actions that you will take will be. And that, you know, the, often the writers complain that you send an email and you never get an answer back. And there is no feedback mechanism. If you want to say that something with the app is not working, something the system is not working, there's nobody really listening. So this, uh, this plus the data driven performance that I, evaluation that I described, the fact that you are constantly monitored is what we call the digital um, layer of precarity. But precarity um, 
as we discovered for these people basically means the same old things that 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 have always been uh, talked about which is poor working conditions and um, higher insecurity and um yeah, lack of ability to plan for the future. So most people leave these jobs um, and this huge rotation of riders means that on one hand, it's very hard to organize and to change anything. But if you look at it from the other perspective, it also means that many people in Berlin have had the experience of riding for one of these companies for working, um, for example, also in Amazon warehouse. And um, so what is the result of all this? The result is that if you live in a big urban center and you're a young person, so imagine Berlin, London, Paris, um, a lot of young people from around the world had this experience of this digital precarity. And um, this is what I call Erasmus minus. You have multicultural environment, uh, so, in a, in a way, it's a, it's a positive thing that, you know, there's some kind of unifying uh, experience that, that all these people, very different people have, but it's Erasmus minus, because what we're talking about is basically an, an internship to precarity, an internship to entrepreneurship, uh, because for a lot of these people, their first job will be, you know, being an inter entrepreneur, self-employed on bike. Um, and what it means is that, so I already mentioned that if we look at the countries where migrants uh, come from, this is where the labor protections are weaker. And that, so it's a geographical problem, but now we also have a generational problem where a lot of young people um, don't really, didn't, didn't even really understand when we talk about certain concepts like gute Arbeit, good work, um, when we talk about labor laws, nobody has ever, had a chance to explain to them what a work contract is and what 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 benefits it um, it brings. So this is this is my experience. This is uh, after talking to many workers from Eastern Europe, many workers that only ever knew these kind of jobs. Is that um, the deterioration of working conditions plus this um, overall overall ideology of the Silicon Valley means that there's a, not only a deterioration of working conditions, but there's a deterioration of values or deteriorations of um, of an image of what a perfect perfect um, employment situation should be. And you know, I sign sign up for this newsletter of uh, somebody who was an editor of a column um, in one of the newspapers and then today I get an email saying I'm going solo I'm going the going solo going self-employed is the new holy grail of um, of work and I think that you know I'm I painted a scenario in which um, we're talking about this guy that maybe is less visible or driving for Amazon or DJL or the delivery student from Poland or India. Um, but we're talking about also a broader phenomenon of self-employed that doesn't only concern um, the most vulnerable um, that we are focusing on today and the people that really have to be protected. But what I've discovered in a lot of discussions about this topic is that we are in this scenario where self-employment is becoming the new norm. So when we, in our maybe more um, policy-oriented bubble, uh, talk about how to solve this problem, uh, think about what, what could be done, then a lot of people uh, in the broader society don't really understand what we're talking about because for them, this is the new thing. This is how this we should all be self-employed. And even if we are employed, and this is what COVID really mm, brings about, then we should have the same con the working conditions in our employment contract that give us the flexibility that's almost uh, on par with uh, the self-employed people. So we should also be able to work any time we want from any place we work want and with as little supervision as possible.
So I do think that the most important question today is uh, what can we do to protect people um, who are the mobile workers who are really forced to self-employment or who really don't understand what the consequences of self-employment are. And I would be very excited to hear from the other panelists what they think that could be done, should be done. Um, I have to say that I'm a little bit of a little, little bit skeptical uh, when I hear that the answer should be to strengthen the unions. I think the unions have done a great job. Um, some of them, for example, in Berlin, we had the FAO, the anarcho-syndicalist union that mobilized deliverance for the riders, um, and we. We will hear from somebody from NGG that even went as far as establishing a Betriebsrat, a works council. So there have been real successes. But when I hear, for example, recently from Joe Biden that unions should be the answer, that we will now make a huge investment in building unions. And at the same time, there's a the news that elections in an Amazon warehouse failed and that um, even in a place where there's fully normally employed people. Um, a platform was able basically a, to lobby successfully to portray unions as a, bad, as a bad actor. I mean, unions don't love migrants and they definitely don't love self-employed people. And to be honest, migrants and self-employed don't love unions back. I'm not saying that resistance doesn't work. And I, 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 I know, and I, have written about successful cases of resistance also without unions, because every time there's control in the management system, there can be resistance. And um, resistance is not futile. Uh, in this case, for example, in Deliveroo, they have been enough, they have been in, annoying enough that Deliveroo basically got scared that they're gonna, there's gonna be a lawsuit and they pulled away from Germany. So, you know, companies leaving uh, our countries, platforms going bankrupt, that's a good result. That means that this business model is not working and that there has been enough pressure from either bottom up or from the general public that um, that this business model is just not going to catch in, but we shouldn't be happy because that means that they move to Brazil, Saudi Arabia, or places where um, the business, but where this labor model is weaker. So I'm skeptical of the emphasis that I hear often on unions or organizing because it means that the burden of responsibility is moved from bottom up for the workers themselves, even though, as I think I explained, there are really big obstacles to, to bringing about change. So I personally think that the change should come from top down. And I am I am listening to what happened in Porto yesterday. And I am very excited that there is a new agency, the European Labour Agency. And I think that we should really invest in defining the mandate of this uh, agency and include very specific recommendations that we want uh, in, in terms of the self-employment problem. I mean, I think first I, I would be very excited to hear what are the proposals, but I think that one thing that we can definitely go with, there has been enough court rulings uh, in European countries that show that countries, that companies like uh, Deliveroo or Uber um, that's not real self-employment, that's fake self-employment, that it should just be a European policy to say that this is banned. Yeah, I, let, I think that's, 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 really, that's a really good, good point. You've made so many. Um, I think that, you know, let, let's, let's get to the point about bogus self-employment, perhaps when we've gone through the, the, all the speakers, um, because I, I mean, I, I guess each of, each of them has something to say and Henry in particular, uh, about that, given the recent judgments in the UK. Um, so, you know, it, if it's okay with you, I want to I want to say that I think that um, you've done a great job of demystifying the the kind of technological messianism inside uh, the platform um, economy, and and I think that pointing out that really these kinds of um, businesses have, have exploited the lack of protections that already were there, particularly for self-employed people, particularly for migrants, and I guess 
maybe you would agree also for younger people in generally in general who are badly protected in our um, social system so i think that's a really powerful way of talking about it and i think the way that you sort of drew the the broader um um implications of a change of mindset uh, amongst a whole generation maybe even parts of a whole society in terms of what people are aspiring to as really the the big challenge but i think that happily um you know not everybody <laughs> not everybody um kind of puts up with it and some people as you as, as you say do fight back so i, I want to you know if it's okay move on and, and hear from someone who, who who worked in in this economy and did fight back um ori you worked as a as a delivery rider and you know i want i want you to share your story that um the conditions you can you can describe what the conditions were like and what drove you then to try and campaign to change them and the ways in which you've been trying to do that um ori please yes thank you for the invitation and uh, good evening to everybody listening here um yeah well um the situation i think for three or four years ago i was working at fedora first and set up delivery and you can pretty much say that all of us were i'm sorry to say it like that but uh, i i learned to use drastic word to describe the drastic situation we were in a fucked up situation um we were in a situation that we um had to write every day my typical shift was like 10 to 11 hours a day uh, with my own bike i took something like um about 100 between 100 110 kilometers i ride uh, with my own bike cycle and uh, which i had to pay for myself and if any one of you has a, a little bit of experience with bike equipment um, and knowing that the weather is not always like sunny and it's dry or whatever, but the weather is very stormy most of the time, then you will get a pretty much good idea of how expensive it is to keep your bike fixed, to keep your bike working, to make sure that you can work at any time possible, even if it's storming, because uh, we have been paid by the hour. So basically means at this time we got something like nine euro, around nine euro each hour. And for each hour we uh, wasn't around, we didn't get paid. We had to use our own mobile phone. Um, and on the mobile phone, we had to install the app, which uh, Fedora uh, forced us to use it. And this was a big problem because uh, we have to give the app a lot of um, um, permissions to search our data, to track us uh, 24 seven, which is a really big problem. If you think about it, that when you are in the private room, you are trying to rest and through or, or deliver, uh, could still track you that you're actually at home. This is like a dystopia nightmare. Um, so, um, and this was a big problem, the collection of information about our personal life. But at the same time, the app was always working, was always switched on, which means we had to buy um, way more new mobile phones than you normally would need to. So let's say in a year, um, uh, every three or four years, you would buy one mobile phone. But for the typical rider in my days, it was like I had to buy every six or seven or eight months a new mobile phone because um, the battery power was wasted so much because it was always turned on. And, um, I, and if I didn't want that after two hours, I had to break up my shift, um, then I had to buy a new one. So the next big problem was uh, the contracts. Um, we were employed in six months contracts, uh, which means that we always was in some kind of toxic atmosphere because we were always under a lot of pressure because we always knew if we are going to assist, if we are not perform well enough work hard enough we won't get uh, a new contract like the liberal photo never really told us that we won't get it but they used some specific mechanism like let's uh, they, they they put up some some competition and then um they always praising the top five riders and then asking the other riders the other owners to be faster uh, otherwise uh, they couldn't guarantee that we could get a new contract stuff like that um how all those things escalated is in Christmas, I think, uh, a few days before, because we didn't get our salary the second month in a while. 
And when we confronted them, we asked them, what's up? Why don't you pay us the money? We need the money. When is this soon to be due? Delivero of Fedora, the boats told us that um, we would get at least Christmas money around like 150 euro, and we should be happy that we at least have a little bit money for Christmas. And after Christmas and New Year's Eve, they would see uh, about the um, money they still had to pay. And this was the pay uh, moment where we always like, okay, discussing our options. We didn't know what to do at this time. We didn't even know that there are labor unions. We didn't even know about our labor why we didn't uh, the only option we knew how to fight back is to collectively quit this job but luckily for us there was one guy who knew about the labor union and basically stopped us and told us about the wait you have two options to leave right now to piss off the libero but then tomorrow they will hire 100 200 new riders so that's it or you have the second option, you can organize yourself and you can fight back because especially in Germany, there are some certain labor laws who are protecting people like us in a certain, to, to a different degree. Um, needless to say that we were pretty much excited to hear about the option that there are basically ways to strike back and that we basically have the right in Germany to go on strike and whatever. And um, so we went to the labor union, we made up an appointment. And the first step what happened was basically nothing but political education. So we have been educated by the labor uh, secretaries and what exactly are labor laws, what are our options. Um, this was the first time we heard about the works council, the option to found a work council. Um, and the powers that comes with it, like that you can force the companies to do uh, certain things um, in, in order to protect the labors. Um, and then we just basically decided, okay, fuck it, let's do it. Um, we have nothing to lose. And we basically did this. We um, first tried to organize ourselves. And at this time, we didn't knew that we already did classical, uh, a work, uh, uh, organizing work like we already have establishing a community because um, before we haven't before we ever was in contact with the labor union we organize ourselves like helping out each other because we had the problem as our workplace it was almost impossible to meet each other face to face this is um, one big problem we were always in a hurry we were always driving really fast and didn't have time to talk but there was some certain hotspot in different places in the city, um, restaurants who has uh, getting a lot of orders. And those orders, um, um, those restaurants were the places where we were able to talk to the writer and say, hey, I didn't see your face before you are new. I'm already working two years here. Let's meet up later, four hours, five hours later after the shift at this place or at this location. And I will tell you how the rules are. As Joanna already said, that uh, many of the rules uh, the laborers didn't know about, but those who had already had worked for a few years already figured it out. So we basically met each other up and we uh, showed them, okay, uh, what are the shortcuts? What do you need to know? Um, uh, what kind of clothes do you need to buy? Um, what, how, to, how to fix the bikes? And with doing this, um, we already established. Um, a spirit of solidarity among us so that uh, we establish uh, a trust um, from the people who already work, was working a long time at the Libro Fodora to the new people who just joined. And then um, when we decided to found a working council, we both basically uh, only had to write in the WhatsApp group, come to this day at this uh, location at this time. And in Cologne, everybody came, all of the writers that came because they trusted us. And um, since that, the whole situation pretty much escalated because um, at this time, there were two options of how to work at the Liberal. You could choose to work in a six month contract or you could work in a freelancer contract, in a self employment contract, which we know were uh, so called fake self employment contracts. And at the day, our people has voted for a working council. Delivero declared basically war on us 
by changing all of the contracts to from from um, six month contracts to freelancer contract. And it's important to know that in Germany right now, if you are self-employment, you have no right of democratic uh, participation, no right of minimum wage or no right of uh, social insurance and then those kind of stuff. Um, so they basically tried to destroy it, which in the end they were able to do. But um, we decided to fight against it by starting an online campaign because we realized, okay, with the um, usual traditional organizing methods, um, we won't get very far. So what do we need to do is that we need to mobilize and alert the public because at this time um, we were doing in work, but this kind of work whose invisibility or invisible, sorry, invisible to the society, such as uh, delivering food. Um, people never really saw us as humans. They already saw us as just workers who just doing their job and that's it. So we needed to scandalize those kind of working conditions and what we are against it. And we were using social media, started the campaign, and we wasn't really sure how it's going to work out and were really surprised by the feedback we were becoming from the public. Suddenly politicians came to us, suddenly um, the labor unions were supporting us st um, um, uh, stronger than ever before. Uh, suddenly the public people, press uh, would ask about it and would put a lot of pressure on Deliveroo um, and would pr put a lot of pressure on the politicians um, to change something about those kind of st uh, situation. And at this time we decided, okay, well, uh, we might have lost the work council, but we didn't lose the struggle because um, we were keep organizing the wider at Podora, establishing more work councils in order to put um, um, a power force inside the company. Um, because uh, the work council is a very important tool to um, um, call all the riders together and inform them about the way I can organize them because the problem is, um, the wicked problem we still face to this day is the contracts of 12 months now. Um, it's Lieferando who are buying the companies uh, of Fedora, they had bought it. And, um, but the problem has still remained the same. So um, this is the situation right now. We established six different work council in the whole of Germany. And um, we are trying to educate uh, workers about the right because we are facing the problem that the people are, are coming from different countries, from Europe, but also from South America and other places um, 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 who have different ideas of labor union. Uh, depending from which country you are from, the name labor union, it's still some kind of or some level of fear. So um, so we had to acknowledge those kind of fear and learn how to deal with it. And so we had to find some specific kind of people of riders who are coming from different countries and try to empower them, like try to take away um, the fear and replace it with trust in our work. And we always looked at two specific kind of people who had also the trust of their communities. So basically, we were looking for leaders among the communities and trying to put them on our side. And this is what we are keep working to this day. And this is our strongest weapon and uh, against those kind of exploitation here in Germany. And, and we still put a lot of at the side or with the help of the labor union, put a lot of pressure on the German politics to um, dismiss so-called contract, limited contracts, such as 12 or six months, because as long as they are around the Germany, as long as it will be possible to exploit the people who really need those kind of jobs. Great. This is really interesting um, experience, Ori. I, I, I want to just ask you, you, you mentioned the um, different people having different fears about labor unions. I wonder when you were trying to organize the, the riders, um, were there some of the riders who were really very uh, hostile to the idea of organizing? And what would be the kind of reasons, do you think, that uh, people might not 
want to, to organize? Is it fear of losing their jobs? Is it, I don't know, they don't have time? And how did you approach those problems? There were many different problems. One of the main problems I was among them um, is uh, fear of losing a job. I need the money and uh, I didn't want to risk my only income and risk um, a future scenario on living on the streets, having no home and whatsoever. So yeah, it needed a lot of trust. And secondly, um, we are talking about political organization. We are talking about a society where political institutions are dominated by white people. Obviously, I am black and uh, I learned uh, early on in my life to not really trust people, especially white people, um, to listen to them when it's about changing your own situation. Because the hard truth is, it wasn't really about my situation, it was, it was more about personal gain or whatsoever. And thinking like that, a lot of other people of color have been thinking like that. And, and that I cannot um, put them at fault for thinking like that. Um, this is the second reason. And then uh, the third reason when the labor union invited us, um, of course, the first thing I saw was a room full of white people. So um, it was the, it was two white women who um, never really stopped trying to gain our trust. Like they were really like, yeah, we know it's, it's, it's problematic. We know there's a lot of problems to solve. We need, but we need to do something about this. And we really want you to be one of the people who can do something about it. So like they basically empowered me, they teach me and whatever. Um, the other reasons are, uh, as I already said, the uh, fear of labor unions because they make experiences in their countries such as that um, if they are going to organize, police will come and beat them to death, shoot them or whatever, uh, being burned alive or being kidnapped in the night. So these are stories we have been told about uh, when we had refugees and they were really afraid. Um, because they um, had the idea of, okay, uh, this is a political institution. Everybody who is coming from a politi political institution is really, really bad news. So we should stay as far as possible and stay as quiet as silent as possible. So we had to basically try to explain how things are working. Like, of course, we didn't lie. We said, yeah, sometimes police uh, or many times, too many times, police are fucked up in Germany too but not on those kind of levels such as in the United States or whatsoever. So it's pretty much more safe to safer to organize here. Then um, educational stuff, uh, many people uh, just didn't know what are those kind of things. They just talked, okay, this is only what rich people are doing. So it's, it's a rich people's game and not, uh, not like uh, in our interest. And then there are also some, uh, Joanna told uh, already about it, that at the first time they were like um, pretty excited about the fact that there's self-employment, that they uh, have to can be both on their own time. And they felt it like it was an attack on them when we tried to change the condition because they felt like we were trying to take something away. But then luckily for us, most of the time, especially when winter hits, they realized that, uh, yes, the idea of self-employment might work in at some kind of salary income. But if the salary is too small, that you can't afford anything, that suddenly when it's raining, when it's storming, suddenly you have to pay way more, double the time than you were paying in summer, then you realize how precarious the situation is. Then they hesitantly started to believe us and uh, talk with us about it. Then other reasons were, uh, of course, stuff as um, language, as barriers. At first, we were pretty much arrogant. We talked, well, um, we, the German speaking, we organized, and then that's it. Until we realized we are like maybe 10 or 20 percent of the people working there who can speak fluently German and understand everything, while the other 80 percent doesn't even understand anything what the hell we were talking about. So this was a big mistake we did at the first so um, we tried to change this and put in translated we tried to empower the people who were i don't know speak farsi arabic turkish or whatever and then um, to involve them in making events um, where there was where the german language was forbidden where uh, sometimes german people can be welcomed and say hey it's great that you are here 
uh, please go to the other room, there's food, there's something you're doing, chill, take the time. But right now it's not your show. The show is belong to the people who are coming from India, from from Syria, whatsoever. Um, we have translators there. And suddenly we saw that there are so many different perceptive and so many different worries so that we, we were able to first time really address uh, the worries of the people because um, before they were kind of too shy. I mean, this is what I experienced a lot in political uh, discussions in Germany um, when I came to, I don't know, to an event, to a discussion and somebody stood up and suddenly talked very academic, very political, and I didn't understand anything what people were saying and was really, really, really fast discouraged and wanted to leave. And uh, we changed it and suddenly we found new people who were ready to fight and wanted to fight with us because they felt they are equal and not like equal by words, but equal, treated equal by words and actions. You know, that's, that's, that's a short um, oversee. And of course, we had women in, um, women workers, female workers uh, in our ranks, um, which had different problems to face because we also realized, oh damn, it's all men's again. We have to change that. And um, and, and we did, and, 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 and when we involved, female workers, women, suddenly we could be able to see problems we didn't see before, um, as the, the, the loose kind of stuff. So um, maybe that's as a short overview before I keep talking and talking and talking. Ori, it's so, it's so interesting and somehow inspiring the way you, you, you address these kinds of problems. Um, I, I have so many questions, but I, I want to bring in Henry now because he's, he's also someone who has, has uh, helped to create a different kind of trade union. Um, and so that's, that's, that's one of the main things I want to ask Henry um, to, to pick up some of the threads of the discussion so far. We've heard, you know, Joanna said earlier on that uh, maybe traditional trade unions have not been so good at representing migrants, uh, precarious workers, and not good at uh, dealing with self-employed people. I guess the um, Union of Independent Workers of Great Britain has come up with an alternative strategy. So it would be interesting to hear about that. And both Joanna and uh, Ori have mentioned this question of somehow bogus self-employment. Um, and I know the Independent Workers of Great Britain have been involved in this case against Uber, um, which has challenged this idea that Uber workers are really self-employed. So on these two aspects, and then anything else you want to bring in, it would be really valuable to have your contribution. So Henry, please. Hi, hi everybody. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, it's great to be here and hear uh, the story of uh, Ori and also uh, Joanna um, about uh, how this uh, uh, how the gig economy is affecting uh, workers, uh, especially uh, migrant workers, but also workers who uh, don't have other choice. Workers who uh, uh, need a job and uh, therefore have to accept what is on the what is available. Unfortunately, uh, we have seen that technology is changing the way we work, the way we live. And uh, unfortunately, like uh, labor laws are not keeping up with that technology. And we have seen, uh, especially during this pandemic, how uh, not even the governments are prepared to help these workers. You know, we have seen these workers being called uh, key workers, workers being uh, told that um, they are essential, but they are essential to keep the country running, uh, but they have not been essential when they need uh, protections, when they need employment rights, when they need uh, improvement in their conditions of work. So in a way, uh, the pandemic has been good for these workers in a way that this uh, has helped to bring to the public eye uh, the problems of uh, these workers and the precariousness uh, of, the, of their lives and how this is affecting them. Uh, it, it's been bad because it has exacerbated their problems. We've seen that uh, in the cases of 
uh, couriers that we represent in the cases of private hat drivers who work for Uber, Addison Lee, and all uh, the other part platforms. Uh, we have seen that these workers has, uh, have had to work uh, uh, unprotected and still under uh, precarious conditions of employment. So we as a union have been uh, campaigning uh, in the streets, in the courts, uh, organizing workers. Uh, we are a dynamic union, new, new dynamic union that are trying to organize the uh, so-called unorganizable, the forgotten uh, workers uh, who are forgotten by the government. And, and we have been successful uh, in many cases challenging, challenging these employers. Uh, in many uh, companies, uh, obviously we're talking about big companies here like Deliveroo and Uber, but there, has, there, there is uh, many companies where couriers, for instance, work, where we have been able to achieve an uh, uh, increase in pay uh, to get proper contracts of employment. but. But forcing employers, uh, as I said, uh, challenging it in the courts, but also uh, in the, their doorstep by organizing the workers. So uh, uh, we, in our union, uh, our union was uh, created by uh, migrant workers, migrant cleaners trying to organize uh, the, due to the failure of a bigger union to represent them. Uh, and that's the reason we're still uh, here. Uh, since we uh, uh, basically since the union began, and we have been organizing workers from you know uh, uh, cleaners, uh, security guards, organizing workers in universities, uh, organizing yoga teachers, uh, nannies, and now we you know we have couriers, we have private health drivers, foster carers, workers who uh, you never thought would uh, organize in a union like the IWGB. Uh, but why did? why they decided to organize in this union because uh, there is so much in common that it's not just about uh, you know cleaners uh, being uh, outsourced and facing the problems with outsourcing and uh, low paid jobs but also um, realizing that there is a problem the problem is is wide and uh, the difficulty for us in organizing has been that uh, you know this new uh, new uh, way of working uh, by workers, for instance, being uh, called independent contractors or, or workers and self-employed. The problem is that they are all over the place, so it's not that, like they are in, in one workplace, which it might be a bit easier to organize. Obviously, it's not easy to organize migrant workers uh, and low uh, workers on precarious jobs for the same reasons that uh, Ori was saying in terms of the, the, the issues they face uh, by um, victimization or by uh, experiencing problems um, that they come already from uh, back from their countries as well in some cases. Uh, but I think what have we been successful is in organizing these workers uh, and winning. Uh, as I said, uh, we were talking about the, the cases of, uh, for example, Uva. Uh, where we've been fighting in the courts, we we have win uh, in the court, and challenging them uh, with their bogus uh, employment contracts. And yeah, make no mistake that the the recent ruling of the the Uber case is not about Uber giving this to the workers. It's about the workers who organized and fought them, as I said, on the streets, on their doorsteps, protesting, demanding, but also challenging in the courts. And that's why uh, Uber has been forced to give some of the conditions to these workers. And um, in the case of Uber, obviously there is some. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a huge victory for uh, because we've been fighting really hard to get this. And um, but it's not. It's not all. You know, there is a, the, the court's rule was that uh, workers are entitled to national uh, living wage, uh, pension contributions, paid holiday. Uh, but still, there is other demands that, are, unfortunately, this, this is not backdated. Uh, we, as a union, are uh, putting pressure on the government and also calling on the uh, HMRC, which is the tax revenue, to uh, basically to uh, tell Uber to enforce uh, the the Supreme Court ruling on unpaid waiting times and also. Um, 
we believe that you know the company basically uh, this company is still taking uh, workers for a ride because uh, there is uh, many things that still are not giving to these workers in terms of uh, giving them the benefits uh, like for example minimum wage as soon as they log on their apps not just uh, you know will they are you know as soon as they as I said, they log in the app, but also they should have the right to refuse and save work and also, uh, you know, have a, a protection uh, equipment as well to do their job. So as, we, as, as I said, uh, it's, it's a positive step. However, um, as, as, as I said, uh, Uber is still falling short. Uh, and we need to keep, we need to keep campaigning. We need to keep uh, putting pressure on them. Uh, we recently also uh, had a strike on the 7th of April uh, at the day on the day that delivery was uh, putting uh, their uh, up uh, on the stock exchange and and uh, it was it was successful because we managed to get investors to not to invest in in, in the platform we have around 17 piece uh, back in uh, the demands for fair, uh, for fair terminations, uh, income, and also health and safety protection uh, for riders. We've seen in, in, in also in a, in a study uh, or an investigation by the view of uh, in, in investigative journalists that uh, some riders were getting uh, as little as two pound an hour, uh, at least. Uh, you know, one in in in, in uh, three riders get two pounds uh, an hour. So I think there are things like this that we uh, still need to challenge. Obviously, we are challenging uh, many of these platforms, but it's been it's been a long way. It's been a long way. It's been it's been uh, uh, this has been achieved by organizing workers, making them believe that we can create that change if we unite and work together. Obviously, there are people that um, are uh, not uh, easy to organize, as uh, Ori was saying, because uh, some of them uh, don't see this as a job. Some of them uh, are, you know, students who just are working for to earn a living uh, until they, you know, they finish their studies, for instance. But the issue is that also uh, these platforms are taking advantage of this. To overflow, uh, like in the case of Uber, to overflow the, the, the cars, which uh, is leaving workers with less uh, work. Uh, but also, um, these platforms are, are using this uh, to their benefit because we are fighting as well against unfair uh, terminations. Because uh, whenever there is an allegation, these platforms just with a click of the button. They dismiss workers without any chance to appeal, which is basically leaving them without job, uh, without income to, for their families. And it's uh, it's clear that this is not this is not right. And this is something that we need to keep campaigning. We need to keep uh, uh, fighting in order to improve. And you know, work when it comes to frontline workers, basically, um, as we said, uh, the governments have said they are, they are all essential. Yet what we see in practice as basically a two-tier system, which is exploiting uh, precarious workers in the gig economy and migrant workers. The human basically impact in this uh, system uh, has been devastating uh, than ever, especially during COVID. Um, the way uh, we have been uh, organizing during this pandemic has uh, demonstrated that it's a uh, it's possible to keep organizing, to keep doing stuff, uh, to keep uh, challenging these uh, companies. Uh, but it's not, it's not, it's not an easy ride. But we're trying our best in our union in order to do that. Uh, recently, just to, to, uh, this week, we have a demonstration uh, outside Bolt Bolt offices, which is uh, a taxi operator as well. Because uh, there was a driver who's called Garbage who was stopped while he was working, and uh, he was stopped to death. Uh, there's been many assaults uh, on drivers, 
uh, and the reason we hold the demonstration outside the offices was because although we have written to them to improve their safety in uh, in their application in the app they haven't done so and they don't even respond to us so we have to resort to this practice of uh, you know go to doorstep and shame them uh, because uh, they have to improve these conditions this uh, you know put job security for these workers because the, the issue is that they're treating them these workers just yes, as numbers and this is a big problem and this is uh, uh, you know the precariousness of these uh, jobs is what is creating all these issues the government is not doing anything about this so it's up to the workers to keep campaigning to keep uh, protesting on the streets and for us as, as unions that are protecting these workers to keep challenging them uh, in the courts. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Henry. It's, it's, I mean, it's really inspiring that the success that IWGB is, has, has been able to have and hearing you speak, you, one, one feels that the struggle is, is, is really ongoing. Um, I just want to ask you one follow-up question. Um, is that many of these companies, Uber, Deliveroo, uh, multinational companies uh, acting in many different countries. I want to ask you as a, as a representative of a union about transnational degree, uh, IWGB is linking up with other unions across Europe, across the world. How, how does this look? Is there, do you feel like there's a lot of collaboration between, between unions or maybe IWGB is quite unique and so there's not many similar unions to join up with? How does it look? I mean, uh, recently uh, we had, as I said, we have this strike uh, uh, against the library uh, and we have uh, a workers strike in, in many cities in London. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, in, in, uh, in the UK. But um, we also had uh, action uh, internationally, like in Australia, France, Netherlands, uh, Ireland, Spain. We have uh, many uh, colleagues uh, from our uh, countries who are also uh, living the same struggles. And we are uh, creating links in order to uh, you know, fight against these uh, uh, platforms who are exploiting workers in order to improve the situation, I think it's very important that we create these links because uh, these uh, companies are trying to expand all over the country. And uh, it's uh, the only way to, to, um, to challenge them. You know, they have huge, they have, uh, they have the governments on their side. They have uh, millions uh, of uh, you know, uh, investors uh, putting millions in the companies. And for us, we are uh, like in our in our case, we are a small trade union that are fighting over our weight. But um, therefore, we believe it's very very important to create those uh, uh, connections uh, of solidarity and 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 fight together in that way in order to improve the situation. We have shown here in the UK that is it possible. We have shown that we forced uh, Uber to do that. We have forced that we, we've shown that we have forced many other companies. You know, in the case of Deliveroo, on one day we managed to raise ten thousand uh, pounds for the strike fund. We managed to get MPs um, to support. We managed to get um, uh, investors not to invest, uh, and created even a tool to see uh, to to see how workers are, are being paid uh, uh, two pounds an hour. So yeah, I think uh, solidarity is very very important and is very very crucial especially at these times that we are not able to do a lot of things that we normally would do in terms of protesting. Our... Thanks, thanks for this. Um, so now I wanna sort of open up a more general debate and, and anyone from the, the audience who wants to post a, post a question, please feel free to do so. Um, but perhaps I, you know, I, I said at the beginning that one of the things we want to achieve is to get some recommendations from these uh, discussions. Um, and those recommendations could be, if you like, policy recommendations for the, for the governments, uh, whether it's the UK government, whether it's the, the European Union, international action, whatever. And, and, and Joanna already kind of mentioned one, which would be about just getting rid of fake uh, self-employment. Um, so 
either recommendations like that or recommendations perhaps to other workers um, or other unions about how to face some of the challenges in the platform economy. So I want to kind of invite each of you back to react to anything you want to react to or develop your thoughts a little bit further and perhaps propose one or two uh, ideas as recommendations that we can take away from this, this event. And you know, I, want to, I want to do that in the next 15 minutes or so. So don't take too long. Don't take too long about it. So maybe we go in the same order. Joanna, if I could start. What recommendations, if you had to formulate them, would you try to put? But you need to unmute yourself. Is there, we would have to say it at some point. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. I just wanted to say that the work that um, we heard from NGG and IWGB is phenomenal and beyond inspiring. It has already changed the, the whole scenario, right? We now have MPs. We now have politicians in the European Union that not only have heard the voices of these workers, but are now saying they're actually representing them. And this is this is this is the best victory that we could imagine for unions. But I want to be very clear, and this is where my recommendation is: there are millions, there are tens of millions of workers across the European Union alone, and not even mention the globe, that will never hear of any of these unions. And this is why I opened with this image of the guy from Poland driving his minivan across Germany. He will never hear, he will never even talk to another driver. It is not the fact that I don't want the, un the unions to be in the driver's seat. They, 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 they should be and they will be. But I want to say that this cannot be the only solution. So if, if I'm supposed to narrow it down to the recommendation, it means that the right to organize and not, I don't mean unionize, but the right to organize should be granted to all self-employed people. So in many countries, self-employed people are not legally allowed to unionize. So we have to give the right to organize because sometimes organization can be very small. And when we listen to Ori um, and we listen uh, to Henry, we don't hear the amount of work that it takes to even organize elections over works council, but this is many, many hours. And in many workplaces, this is, there's nobody to do that. There's nobody to, so this, we should, we should institutionalize the very, very small forms of organizations and we should give the right to strike to everybody, not only people who have formally uh, collectivized. So right to organize for self-employed people, right to strike for everybody. This is one thing, but the, I, I, the second thing I want to say that it is not only bogus self-employment that we need to think about. So we have made huge advances in Europe, thanks to uh, this amazing legal work, which by the way, the, the, it should just become general policy. Everything that we have heard from courts across Europe, it should just become law in, in European Union law. But the bogus self-employment is not the only problem. We have many self-employed people that are that do have that do meet the legal conditions for self-employment. That doesn't mean that they shouldn't have protections. We need to extend our policy recommendations beyond fighting bogus self-employment because at the bottom there's there's million people that that are actually self-employed. And what does it mean? Does it mean that they that that they don't have to pay into uh, the social security system, for example. The, the one thing I really want to say is we are all paying the price of the spread of self-employment. That means that there is less money going to social security system. That means that there's less money to going to healthcare system. So that means that it is not only up to the workers themselves and especially not only up to self-employed workers themselves to fix this problem. This is a general population problem. So if we, it's like saying, let's leave it up to workers, let's leave it up to unions. It's like saying, let's leave matters of public health to patients. Patients should organize. So if we hear from patients that there's a problem, then we will fix it. No, this is the same, this is a great analogy. If 
if there's a spread of self-employment, then there's there's people that don't make decent wages that cannot invest in their own families in the education of their children and then there's less money in the social security system which means that pensions for everybody will be lower and we will have poverty growing in your opinion and so this is a public general public problem so we cannot just leave it up to the workers we have to just like with the case of uh public health system we just have to vote for politicians that care and have the solutions that we don't maybe always we're maybe not always able to come up with thanks uh, thanks it's really very clear ori what would what would your recommendations be obviously um it might be a little bit different than from that what joanna is saying um i mean yes i agree that many uh, people who are working in those kind of sectors um, millions of people never heard of the labor union, but that's the educational problem. That's the problem we have to solve. Um, I mean, we just have to look at history. It's a challenge that um, nobody else will take up responsibility but the workers people. So it is our struggles we have to organize uh, among uh, ourselves and have to fight those um, kind of exploitation with strikes. We have to unionize them um, because these are our strongest weapon we actually have i mean there are, we can there there are no other option to force these companies um to actually improve the conditions so to wait uh, uh, before the people from the top are actually going to discuss about if things are going to change it's not enough um i mean when i'm thinking about it i mean up three or four years ago i never heard about labor union but at the same time i also never really cared and heard about uh, democratic participation rights about election about voting because I never felt part of the society. So this is what basically is one of the big problems we are facing now that that um, we are living in societies which are separating the people when you are white or when you are looking like uh, the majority you are getting um, some specific kind of I, I don't know to say privilege but some kind of privilege and some kinds of confidence and feeling that you belong to the society. And then there are other people, people like me, who are hard of hearing, disabled and black, and always getting um, communicated that I'm worth nothing, and that I should be happy working this kind of job. And I actually believe that, because that, that is what I was thinking, that if I work hard enough, people are going to accept me. But this changed. Mm -hmm. It changed with only uh, two people. There were two young women who talked to me, who never gave up on me, who uh, always were there when I realized like having um, doubts when I was like not feeling confident when smart people who were academic and educated tried to confuse me with stuff. So then they were at my side and tried to break it down like in simple words. What does gig economy mean? What does uh, work council mean? What does it mean to like to, you know, um, um, negotiate um, collective agreement? What does it actually mean? Um, then um, uh, I, 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 I started to develop some trust and I started to try and to educate myself and I passed it on to the other people, to other workers who never also heard about um, uh, uh, labor units or didn't even trust about them. Um, it's a it's small step and it takes a lot of time. But to me, I don't see another way but uh, to educate our workers people and to show them that they actually have a lot of power if you think about it. That the biggest part of migrants workers are making the low income sector. So if they all suddenly stop to work, the whole system is going to be fucked up. Like nothing is going to work. We can see it already in Germany when the trade union of the train sector is calling for a strike. It's only a small part of people uh, com comparing to the, uh, the, the total number of the German citizens, but still every German citizen is feeling that because the trains suddenly are not working. So um, maybe we have to go a more strategic way that we are going to organize some specific sector where basically the impact will be like um, impossible to ignore to all the other people, other people then realizing, okay, well, we have to change the condition of the people because they're being exploited. Um, I mean, when we are seeing, we have a big problem, I only can speak for Germany. We have a big problem in Germany with the delivery services, maybe a food or parcel, but we never really see them. We never really talk to cleaners at McDonald's 
we never really see them as humans. We, we, we don't even see them as workers, but most of them are black or Turkish or whatsoever. And not only are they not getting paid any money whatsoever, but they are being disrespected um, many times, being attacked on a, on a racist level. And um, when I started with some of other people of color organizer, they suddenly felt like, okay, there are people who actually care about them and there are people who actually want to fight with them to change things. So, but, we, but it basically means we need way, way, way more organizers. We need way, way more people who are coming from the different communities because this is our secret weapon. If you are German and you are trying to organize a, a community who are basically dominated by Seneca people, good luck with that. So, because then this will be like a whole mess. But if you are getting an organizer who's understanding the difficult, uh, different, not difficult, different cultures of uh, the marginalized communities, then yes, we will have a chance to change this thing. And I don't see any other option to do that. It may take a lot of time, of course, and I'm not saying this will change in one year, but we have to do that. Thanks. Thanks, sorry. Henry, I, I want to have your uh, recommendations. I guess you have you have many. Your, your, your union is there to come up with these kinds of recommendations. But if you choose one or two priorities for addressing the rights of platform workers, and then there's um, a, a, a direct question for you in the in the chat. Someone is asking if you could expand on the way you calculated that one in three riders only get two pounds an hour and why it was powerful to have such figures to be able to campaign with. Um, I don't know if you can, you can try to address that as well. Yeah, obviously, uh, it would be great uh, you know, if, 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 if we can ask, uh, uh, if, if we can have an answer uh, to improve this situation. I guess uh, at this moment in time, there is no answer or how, how, how this is going to be improved. Uh, unless the workers take action uh, through the union, like us, for instance, who is uh, organizing them, uh, we see that uh, the government, as I said, is not going to change this uh, soon. And many of these uh, big corporations are lobbying government. Uh, we we saw how uh, you know uh, in the delivery uh, day of strike. Uh, we have uh, the, the, the um, Ricky Sunak, who is the chancellor, saying that uh, basically he branded Deliveroo as a British tech success. That shows, you know, how they see this this company. They don't see the human side. They see this as as uh, a more outside of the economic. Uh, um, but uh, as I said, um, I think. Uh, John is right. This shouldn't be left uh, only to the workers at the unions. Uh, I think uh, this is something that needs to be uh, more wide uh, in order to, 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 to fight and improve. Uh, it has to involve MPs. It has to involve uh, uh, more organizations. I think, as I said, uh, this, uh, this precarious uh, employment uh, is changing the way we live. Obviously, it's making things easy. Um, for people like ordering food, ordering a taxi, and, and many other things, you know, using like buying from Amazon, but at the, end, at the same time, it's leaving the workers uh, in precarious uh, conditions and families also um, in these precarious situations. And I think, uh, I think that obviously the recommendations uh, would be to, uh, you know, to, to improve, to fight to improve this. Uh, uh, we're not. We've been we've been asking in the courts, uh, demanding in the courts, uh, uh, taking these companies uh, to that uh, length uh, to do to improve the situation. Um, but it's, it's been a long fight. It's been uh, very uh, uh, hard to get even lawyers, uh, guard barristers, to be fighting in the court for us in a small trade union who is low on written resources. It's been very difficult. Uh, somehow we have managed to to, to do that to get uh, people who uh, support us, but it's it's, uh, it's a difficult situation. And I think uh, at this moment in time, uh, is the workers we need to keep organizing, we need to keep uh, um, getting together in the communities, 
and expanding the voice so we can uh, create uh, you know a, 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 a collective power that is able to fight uh, together with uh, uh, the unions I mean that's why I think uh, is it's, it's a way forward for future I, I don't see any other way for things to improve uh, you know we have tried the course we have to have some success but um, it, it, it is difficult, and I think uh, at this moment in time, is the workers who need to organize to improve the situation in this uh, country. Thanks, Henry. And I, I just see that there's another question which maybe you can you can try to address, which is about the impact of immigration controls on the precarity of workers. Um, you know, in in the UK, there's 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 ever tighter immigration controls i wonder how what sort of pressure does that put members of your union potentially under um, and to what extent is the union also involved in trying to change that the way that immigration is perhaps talked about and and, and controlled in the uk yeah that, that's another difficult situation for people for workers to organize especially migrant workers uh, who are uh, who are working uh, on those platforms but also in uh, precarious employment, not just on the in the gig economy, we, we have we represent the cleaners, uh, for instance, in this country, workers who work in in precarious jobs such as hospitality, who are uh, you know who have the worst conditions of employment, uh, and the only way we have been able to 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 win and achieve uh, better conditions has been through organising, through protesting, through demonstrating. We see now with this uh, new bill that the government in the UK is trying to pass, which is basically going to silence the voices of these people, going to silence uh, uh, unions like us, because uh, for us the law is not, not is not the, the law is not on the side of the migrants, it's not on the side of precarious workers. Unfortunately, that's the way it is in this country. If if employers don't pay you one month of wages, you cannot get the money back because. Uh, is, is, so there's no institutions from the government that are going to challenge that uh, to an employer. It's, it's, the work, it's left to the worker to, uh, to get that through the court. Who, who is going to get a lawyer, is going to pay a barrister to do that job? For a, we have seen many, many of these cases on a daily basis in this country where people are robbed with their wages, but there is no uh, way. The only way we have been able to, to get back that has been protesting outside these employers, shaming them. But now, if this bill gets passed, it's going to be very difficult, not just for the workers, but for many organizations who are uh, fighting to improve, uh, you know, fighting against racism, against inequality, against poverty. It's going to be very difficult. And this is something that we are, uh, we have been uh, campaigning as well in order to stop. Uh, just last week, we have a demonstration where it was which is called Kill the Bill. We are very supportive because, as I said, it's going to silence uh, many workers and, 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 and people from, uh, uh, you know, migrant communities, and uh, it's going to put them in a difficult situation. So I think, uh, yeah, in terms of yeah, the immigration law, I think it's, it's very difficult now, with, especially with the uh, hostile environment that we live in here. Thanks, Joanna. I see you, you want to kind of yeah, I want to mention something because I was uh, organizing and researching with the sans papier, the undocumented migrants in Paris during the Sarkozy era. And that was a time that deportations were, you know, going through the roof. And two things that I learned at that time, it is not impossible to organize if you're undocumented migrants. Many undocumented migrants um, that were coming from Mali or Senegal had a better education about human rights and workers' rights than many people that I know from Poland. And they were very brave and, you know, they were demonstrating despite the risk of deportation. So it's, it's just, that's what I learned, that sometimes the people that are most vulnerable are the most uh, brave also to organize. But what I also learned is that the immigration controls and the threat of deportation, it's just a part of the system. It is part of the system of uh, what Henry mentioned. The governments are being lobbied by the big corporations to keep certain laws in place. 
And then from a different angle, uh, other actors are lobbying to tighten immigration, but actually this is the same thing because the fear of deportation is the thing that will make people accept any working conditions that are in place. So this is the same actors that have interest in both not necessarily deporting people because we all know that there is still um, a lot of need for, um, for, for workers in many, many sectors. So everybody knows that, but what, we, what, what these actors really want is for people to, I mean, be afraid uh, that they're gonna be sent back to their country and to, to not organize and to not lobby. So this is, this is two sides of the same coin. I think this is a really powerful point to link these two kinds of precarity as actually reinforcing one another and acting in uh, the interests of, of certain certain powerful actors. Um, look, I think we've had a really rich uh, discussion this evening, and and it's it's Saturday evening, so I don't want to take up every all of all of your time. Um, I, I feel like we, we've launched an important conversation here about about uh, the the rights of workers in the platform economy. We've come up already with quite a few uh, ideas of of what what could be proposed to do about it. We've had some really inspiring practices as well. Um, in the chat, uh, uh, my colleague York has has left a link for anyone in the audience who wants to suggest further uh, recommendations. And I think that, what, as I introduced at the beginning, um, this is really part of a, an ongoing project of European Alternatives in another Europe, looking at different sectors and coming up with all kinds of recommendations. So we're gonna get back to uh, everybody who's taken part as a speaker or as an audience member in the, in the discussion today with um, some of these ideas. Uh, turned into recommendations and the others that we collect as we go forward having uh, future conversations. Um, I want to really take the moment to thank Joanna, Ori and Henry for um, all, their, all their input and to wish all of us the best of luck and the most um, forthright courage in uh, continuing to fight for um, the rights of, of workers um, and, and citizens and residents really whether they're working in the platform economy or not. Uh, these are tough times for lots of people. Um, and so uh, I also personally, I take some energy from, from moments like this, even if they're mediated by, by technology, uh, we can still hear the, the, the edifying stories of, of courage and invention and uh, collective intelligence. So that's what I'm taking forward with me for, for this evening. I'm now gonna go and share it with, uh, with people that I meet. I encourage you all to do the same. Uh, solidarity to all of you and hope to see you all soon. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.